She was a little bit uh, uh, frustrated that the doctors here in Pittsburgh were not able to discover that. So uh, yes, for us, it's been very frustrating that she's been living with us for four and a half years. Um, and at some point you throw up your hands and almost give up, but we're very grateful that God has provided the right place, the right time, and uh, we have hope that uh, Chris will start feeling better very soon. So that's that news. Um, and so thank you again for your prayers. I want to make sure everybody got all of that together at the same time. All right, let us, uh, let us prepare our hearts uh, for worship today. We do invite you to stand as we make confession before our Lord. Our confession and forgiveness is printed in your bulletins for today. We begin our service in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is from water and word that God gives us new life. Let us therefore confess our sin, that we may be renewed in the covenant of holy baptism. Strong and faithful God, we confess yes. that we not live as the body of Christ in the world. We have built our hearts to the light. We have resisted your call to follow. We have failed to exercise our gift of blood. Forgive us for the sake of Christ. Heal us with your abundant grace. And help us walk as children of life. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ came amongst us to Proclaim release the captives to let the oppressed go free. Today, this promise is fulfilled. God forgives us all our sins. May the Holy Spirit strengthen you to follow Christ in newness of life. Amen. Amen. Let us sing together, opening hymn, Earth at All Stars. <clears throat>
Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Lord God, it is with endless mercy to receive the prayers of all who call upon you. By your Spirit, show us the things we ought to do, and give us the grace and power to do them through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson is found in the book of 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. St. Paul writes, When I come to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming a mystery of God to you in lofty words and in wisdom. I decided to know nothing amongst you except Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet, among the mature, we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish. We speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor human heart can conceive. What God has prepared for those who loved him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. The Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Truly, what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within? So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the Spirit of God. So we have received not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed upon us by God. Here ends the lesson. Again, we turn to the back page. It reminds us that we'll be reading from Psalm 112. Let us read that responsibly. Hallelujah! Happy are they! Who fear the Lord and have great delights in God's hands. Their descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in their house, and their righteousness will last forever. Light shines in the darkness for the upright. The righteous are merciful and full of compassion. It is good for them to be generous in lending. For they will never be shaken. The righteous will be kept in everlasting remembrance. They will not be afraid of any evil rumor. Their heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their heart is established and will not shrink until they see their desire upon their enemies. They have freely give, given freely to the poor, and their righteousness stands fast forever. They will honor their head. It is no longer good for anything but thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city is built on a hill, and it cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand and gives it to light all of the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is heaven. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter 
not one stroke of letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask your blessing upon us today as we open up your word. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You're welcome to be seated. You're also welcome to pull out your hand out for today. And I am going to outright tell you right now, you're welcome to dismiss everything that I'm about ready to say because I got a bee in my bonnet. And when I got a bee in my bonnet, I may be speaking for myself and not for Jesus. So there you go. And I'm going to tell you why. We're talking about a lesson for today about being salt and about being light. And I have tremendous concern that we Christians have sullied the reputation in the name of Jesus Christ, especially over these last years in this country. Don't care how you label yourself or call yourself. We are salt and we are light. We are salt. We are salt, and the intention, the purpose of salt is to give flavor to the meal which you are putting in front of you for today. We are called as Christians to make the world more palatable in which to live. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we making it more palatable? If we as salt have lost our taste, the Bible says that we become basically foolish. That would be a more accurate translation. If it has lost its taste, it cannot be made salty again. It is not good for anything. We have become foolish. A foolish disciple has lost credibility. Salt, in addition, prevents corruption. So salt has multi-purposes. To provide flavor, to prevent co corruption. What the world wants to do is lower the standards by which one could have a relationship with God. But we need to grasp for a higher standard and stand in the gap on behalf of those who are weak and powerless and those who do not believe. Rather than standing in judgment, we stand with our hand outstretched. And so here's my concern. This is where you're welcome to dismiss me. And then I'll take you when we really get back to the lesson. But yes, I've got to be in my bonnet about this. Because what we need to do is stop evaluating ourselves by the values of this world. And I am convinced whether, especially in this country, right-wing Christians, left-wing Christians, they compare themselves to the values of this world. Left-wing Christians say, we're countercultural. Well, you know what? You're still comparing yourself to the world's values. Oh, the, the right wing Christian. Well, we've got, we're the moral majority. We got the morals of God. No, you don't. Your morals represent a failed morality that does not represent Jesus Christ. We need to start representing Jesus, not some countercultural idea, not the moral majority. We're not moral at all half the time. We need to start defining our values by God's values, not by the world's values. So if we define ourselves by the values of the world, we have lost our saltiness. We cease to be able to preserve the world. We cease being representatives of Jesus Christ. We need to represent that which is transcendent. Bad salt, what is it good for? Well, that's kind of hard to imagine. How is it bad salt? <coughs> well, remember, they did not purify salt in their day, like we do today. It came in rocks. And so you'd throw those rocks in the stew, and then at some point, all the salt would be sucked out of that rock, okay? And then that rock was good for nothing, would be thrown out into the path, where it would be trampled underfoot. And so that's what he's saying. If we've lost our ability to preserve this world, if we continue to identify ourselves with the values of this world, we no longer represent Jesus Christ. We're representing the values of the world. And the values of the world always fall short of Jesus. He goes on and he says another image of basically the same thing. We are called to be light. 
We don't produce our own light, by the way. We reflect the light of God. There's only one source of light in this imagery, and that's Jesus. We borrow the light of Christ and reflect it upon others. So therefore, we should be visibly different from other people. If you don't take it, Jesus says, you don't take a bushel and, or uh, put it over top of the candle, then you can't see it any longer. It extinguishes the light. He says, we should, as the light of this world, as reflectors of Jesus Christ, represent the values of the kingdom of heaven. We should be winsome and attractive. And good works will call attention, not to ourselves, but they'll always point to Jesus. This is the problem with people who come and make sure that their donations are seen for the entire world to show the world how generous they are. That is not of God. So here I'm getting my bee in my bonnet again, okay? This is the problem with politics and systems like this. You know why we don't get things done in this country? Because simply everybody wants credit for what happens. And if they can't get credit for it, they're going to oppose everything the other people want to do until they are in power and then they can get credit for it, but they never have enough votes to get credit for it because the other party's going to also oppose them too. How is that of Christ? I'm sorry to be so cynical, but I'm sorry. Christian politician is almost an oxymoron, right wing or left wing, because a Christian politician wouldn't care who gets credit for it. They would just do the right thing. But you got to care who gets credit in the political systems of this world, because that's the only way to stay in power. By definition, then, these political systems cannot be Christian. Right wing, left wing, don't care which. All right, I'm back to it. Hopefully, what does this mean? Christians are called to stand as a visible sign of protest to the values of this world. We are called to be salt and light. We don't live in a cocoon waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ again. A secret disciple, one who doesn't let the world know who he or she is, has lost his or her distinction. We are the salt that prevents the world from being trampled on and uh, trampling on the oppressed. We are the light. We are the salt that preserves the world from destruction. We lose our value when we cannot be differentiated from the world. So if we identify with a political system, and I say right wing, left wing, I don't care which way you are. If you say, I'm a left wing Christian and I'm all about social justice, well, I'm sorry, you're not a Jesus. I'm a right-wing Christian, I'm all about Donald Trump, and I'm all about the moral values. You don't represent Jesus. Because these political systems don't represent Jesus. Joe Biden, Donald Trump, don't care. They're, they're, not, they're not representing Jesus Christ. They're representing the values of this world. The disciple should transcend the law's minimalistic expectations. We have to be differentiated from the world. The law defines our limits and our liabilities. A follower of Christ never ceases to love no matter the circumstance. Doesn't count the cost. So here's our problem that challenges Christians. And I think this is what we gotta, we gotta do something different. We can no longer be affiliated with a group of people or parties anymore. Should ever be. We need to be something different in this divided world. We need, we need to be the salt and the light. And so how we treat each other is how Christ is represented in this world. Sarcasm. Let's start there. Not a gift of the Holy Spirit. See, this is what the sides do to each other. We are sarcastic about people who disagree with us, and we say all sorts of horrendous things. Did you ever see Jesus do that to anybody except for the Pharisees? Religious leaders? He never did that with people who disagreed with him. He never spoke with sarcasm or nastiness toward those who disagreed. Demeaning and diminishing comments that we make or dismissive comments to people who hold different values or different ideas is not the way of Christ. That's 
what our political systems do, don't they? That's what we do whatever side of the argument we're on. We dismiss people. We demean people. We use sarcasm. None of these are of Jesus Christ. They don't represent, represent the values of the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to tell you, I, this is where my being is my bond here today, okay? I've been reading um, a lot of liberal Christian scholarship and a lot of really conservative Christian scholarship for my work at school. And I am so disappointed by the demeanor and the behavior of right-wing and left-wing Christians and scholars who should know better and how they diminish, demean, and dismiss and treat people who disagree with their perspective, both sides. And it is so disappointing because I wonder, how does this represent Jesus? It's devastating to me that the people who are supposed to be in leadership in our churches, our scholars, represent the wrong values, the values that are of this world and not of Jesus Christ. We are called as Christians to build each other up. We are called to be advocates for each other when we're using sarcasm, when we're demeaning people, when we're dismissing people, we're not advocating on their behalf. We are to advocate for those most at risk. We are to do the work of caring and love of God in this world. So yes, like I said, here you can dismiss the rest of this too. You have to understand that we have, I think as Christians, affiliated ourselves with political systems that don't have Jesus Christ at the heart or the center. Here's the kingdom of heaven. Jesus sits on the throne. There's only one law, the law of love. If that is not your politics, then you don't have Jesus' politics. That's it. You can't achieve that in this side of the kingdom of heaven. And so you'll have one group say, we are creating Jesus' kingdom here on earth by doing this. Well, it's a relative righteousness, and you fall short of God's kingdom by this much. You might be that much closer than the other group, but you're still far away from creating the, the true politics of the kingdom of heaven. We can't create the politics of the kingdom of heaven here on this side of the earth. That should not be our interest or desire. We should not as Christians be representing a political ism or system. We need to represent Jesus. So I'm going to tell you here's what the early church did. The early church had no political power. They had no standing in, uh, in Rome. But... Without fail, the early church addressed the needs of the hurting and poor through direct acts of charity and through peaceful protest. There is not one Christian in the first 350 years of Christianity who stood up and said, we need to change the politics of this country. Not one Christian did that. Not one Christian said, I'm going to run for office. They didn't care. Not one Christian said, I'm going to pick up a sword and kill people in the name of Christ. They were peaceful in their protest. And they transformed the world. We need to stop affiliating ourselves with political systems. It is dumb, it is stupid, it is destructive, and it demeans the cause of Christ. No system or political ism reflects the values of the kingdom of heaven. Congregations that collude with political parties take on the baggage of that party, whether it's good or bad. Right wing, left wing, don't care, they're all wrong. They cease to represent Jesus Christ, we lose our moral authority when we become affiliated. I'm a left wing Christian. I'm a right wing Christian. Well, you know what? Then you just lost your moral authority. You no longer represent Jesus Christ. Moral values, what the political right uses to attract Christians, social justice, what the political left uses to attract Christians, are no substitute for Jesus Christ. They fall woefully short. There are clubs that these parties use to beat each other. And that's not a Christian value. We should agree on one thing as Christians. Not our political responses. We should agree on this. What it means to be a Christian is to be a blessing to those most at risk. Our seniors, our veterans, refugees, asylum seekers, aliens in our land that are separated from their children today. The hurting next family neighbor next door.
that we should care does not apply a particular political solution. Political systems dismiss one group in favor of another, but Christians look for those who God has placed in our path, and we find a way to care and love. And so what I'm asking you to do, we're in a political season again. Don't affiliate yourself with going, vote, vote, fine. I think you should vote. But don't affiliate yourself as though your Christian faith is represented by a political party, because it is not. Jesus Christ is to be at the heart and our center. We are to be salt and light. When we affiliate ourselves with the values of this world, we diminish and demean Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ transcends all of this, and we need to represent him. Let us pray. God, I'm first of all going to stand in confession today. Because I do not need to beat or diminish or hurt anybody here. And I know I spoke a lot from my heart, and I really don't know if it's from yours. And so if I've taken an opportunity to express an opinion that doesn't represent yours, I apologize. And I seek the forbearance of this congregation today. But I do pray that you would help us to find something that is transcendent. I do not believe the values of this world represent Jesus, no matter what side of the argument you're on. We need to be transcendent in the values that we can share of Jesus Christ. Because, God, we have to find a way to bridge the gaps that exist and the, the damage that has been done by political parties in this country. We need to find a way to bring people together in Jesus. And that's really what matters. We need to find a way to care for the poor and the needy and the hurting. We need to find a way to speak love, to preach Christ and Him crucified. So God, we ask that you help us to come together as your church to be better, to stand in the gap, to be salt and light for this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm always grateful on these occasions that we have Holy Communion coming. Because it doesn't matter if I've done the poorest job in the world, we will be filled today with the presence of Jesus Christ. I'm going to do something completely different. I'm not going to sing this hymn for today. Call me some life.
Let us confess together the faith that we share with Jesus Christ in the words of the Apostles' Creed. For God has made us his people for a baptism. Living together, trust and hope, we confess together our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Holy Father, we come before you today just acknowledging the desperate need of people in this world to hear of Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would help us better to represent you in this world. People who depend upon us, Lord. And so we pray this day for Carrie and Noah, Rocco, Tina, Jackie, Carrie. We're grateful that Carissa hopefully will be <coughs> finding some solution to her problem soon. For Jeff, Judy, and Joanne, Mrs. Byers, for Cheryl, for Jim, and Mike. May you continue to bless each one of them and surround them with your love. Especially we pray for Janet and Mike, Mike's parents, who know that they need special portion of your blessing this day for the, uh, the, the grant them with energy that they just do not have for they have such a difficult challenge in their hands. We pray for those with cancer. We pray for their families as well, for John and Bob, Mike and Pam, Joseph, Sam and Mike. We know that this is a journey taken by the entire family. We pray for your healing on all of them. We also lift up the state of people of Ukraine for the continued struggles that they have just for water and warmth and food. We pray for some resolution, peaceful resolution, to the danger in which they're in. We also lift up our bishop, Willa Kucherik, and our partner congregations of New Day, and Man, St. John, and also we think of our partners at St. John's, with whom you're doing youth group, and pray that you continue to bless them as well. For Annie and Nick, and all those who are serving our country faithfully, Lord, for the continued division in this country. Uh, we think again, as, as we, we saw last week, and of course, the young man Tiger was uh, murdered by police officers. And we know that this continues to, you know, it's, it's a, a great tragedy for this family, but again, reminds us of the division in our country. Do we just pray for some healing, some way to prevent these types of things from ever happening again? We love the Pauline and Arlene and Peggy and Dorothy, Edna, Gil, Anne, Mary Jo, and Natalie. May your mercy be with them and your kindness. We are so grateful for the privilege of uh, worship, having worship with them, but we miss them very dearly. And pray that they would know that the big father today. Lord, whatever else is on our hearts and minds, we just take a moment of silent prayer to lift all of these concerns to you. In your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all those for whom we pray and trust in your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so we stand on solid ground at this point in our service, knowing that Jesus Christ is always faithful to come to every single one of us through this gift, these simple signs of bread and wine. And so we remember how on the night in which he's betrayed, that our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body given for you, do this in the remembrance of me. He had after supper, he took a cup, and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink you all of it. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. We invite you to prepare the meal which God has so graciously provided you today. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus bless us and keep us in his grace and peace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again for the blessings of this day. We thank you for the gift of salvation, the gift of Jesus Christ our Lord. Strengthen us in your peace that we might be sent from this place to represent the values, not of this world, but of the kingdom of heaven. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord of one in favor and give you peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us sing together our closing hymn for today.
I think Peggy from Peggy. What's that? Oh, did she? She's good to him. Well, I was just going to sprinkle 